AP Biology Unit 5, Heredity, and this is Video 3 where we'll talk about Mendelian genetics. So let's review Mendelian genetics. The idea of a Mendelian trait is one that's controlled by a single gene that has a dominant and a recessive allele. And as a reminder, these are useful in understanding the basics. Most traits go beyond that, and we'll get to that in future units. So let's talk about what makes an allele dominant. Um, what is the mechanism here? So take a look at this diagram and see if you can figure anything out. So what you might see in this diagram is that the allele for purple flowers produces an enzyme that the allele for white flowers does not produce. So in the case of dominance, if um, the flower has or the plant has just one copy of that purple flower allele, it'll be enough to produce pigment to make the flowers purple. Um, and in the case of white flowers, it has to have two copies of those white alleles, whereas you can get purple flowers from having either two purple alleles or just one purple allele because it's enough of the protein product. It's enough of the um, gene expression. All right, some terms related to Mendelian genetics. Um, what does P generation mean and what's the significance of a capital versus lowercase letter? P stands for parental generation, and so that's usually the first generation we're focusing on in um, sort of predicting what the offspring will be. And the significance of capital versus lowercase, capital represents the dominant allele, lowercase represents recessive allele. Reminder that that's only going to be true in simple dominance inheritance patterns. So the next question is, looking at this example where we have a purple flower that has a genotype of big P, big P, and a white flower with a genotype of little p, little p, what gametes can be produced by each of these individuals? So both of these are homozygous, so their alleles are the same. So the big P, big P individual can only make gametes with big P, and the little p, little p individual can only make gametes with the little p. So what are the genotypes and phenotypes going to be of the next generation, which is called the F1 generation? So the F1 generation are going to all be purple and all have the genotype of big P, little p. On the left, you notice that this generation is called hybrid. What is the meaning of the term hybrid? Hybrids are individuals that result from the breeding of tr two true breeding individuals or two um, homozygous individuals. So the F1 individual here, that one on the bottom, is a hybrid and has a heterozygous genotype, meaning it has one allele of each type. True breeding individuals, like the parents, are homozygous, meaning that both of their alleles are the same. So the one on the left with the purple flowers, big P, big P, that's called homozygous dominant because there are two copies of the dominant allele. And the other parent was homozygous recessive, the little p, little p. So now let's focus on that F1 generation further and figure out what gametes can be produced by that plant. So in this case, because this individual has the big P, little p uh, genotype, and in fact all individuals of this generation do, um, those individuals can produce two different alleles, one with a big P, one with a little p. We can use that information to figure out the offspring if we crossed two individuals in the F1 generation. So what would be, what would be the genotypes and phenotypes of the generation, uh, of the F2 generation. So expected genotype and phenotype frequencies can be determined by what's called a Punnett square. So you put the possible alleles from parent one on the top of the chart and you put the potential alleles from parent two on the, um, or potential gametes with all the alleles on the um, left side, and then you figure out what combination those make. So because we were crossing two F1 individuals, um, both of the, the parents are going to be able to produce gametes that have either a big P or a little p, and so then there are going to be uh, three different combinations possible. They could either be big P, big P, they could be big P, little p, they could be little p, little p. And because there are two different ways of creating that big P, little p, that heterozygous individual, the ratio there is going to be one to two to one. So one big P, big P, to two big P, little p, to one little p, little p. 
the phenotypic ratio is going to be three purple to one white because you remember this is a case of simple dominance where the uh, heterozygote and the homozygous dominant have the same phenotype. In genetics, a common technique is called a test cross. Take a look at this and figure out why is this technique called a test cross. This is called a test cross because results of the cross can provide information on an unknown genotype. So in this case, we had a purple flower, but we didn't know if it was homozygous dominant or heterozygous. If we cross that with a known individual known to be uh, homozygous recessive, we can then look at the phenotypes of the offspring and see which, um, which pattern matches the expectation based on each of the um, possible genotypes of the unknown parent. And so if the, purple if the purple flowered parent is big P, big P, we would expect all offspring to be purple. If the purple flower parent was big P, little P, we would expect a mix of purple and white offspring. Now it should be noted that this is going to be much more useful in cases where we can um, control the breeding and that it's a fast breeding process and that we can um, have a lot of offspring to look at. Because if you just had one or two offspring, let's say you had two offspring and they were both purple, you wouldn't know for sure what the um, parent was um, because it's just not enough data. So because so many of our examples in this unit um, are about peas, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about how pea plants uh, work and how you breed pea plants. So pea plants are hermaphroditic, which means they produce both male and female gametes. So the male is the pollen and the female gametes are the um, eggs inside of ovules. When pea plants are crossed, you take the pollen or the sperm from one plant and we'll refer to that plant as the male because it's contributing the sperm. And you use that to fertilize the eggs in the ovules of another plant. And we'll refer to that plant as the female because that's the one contributing the eggs. So there aren't really male and female plants, but we will still use that terminology just because um, I think it's easiest to understand. Okay, so here we go with an example of pea plants. So here we have um, round and wrinkled of seed shape and yellow and green are our seed colors. And we've got two different parents and we have our um, parent pea plant acting as the female and our parent pea plant acting as the male, the female donating the egg, the male donating the sperm. So from this information, see if you can figure out the genotype and the phenotype for both of these parents. So the female genotype is big R, little r, big Y, little y, and that will produce round yellow seeds because both round and yellow are dominant. The male genotype, little r, little r, big Y, little y, and this will produce wrinkled yellow seeds. And this is because the male is homozygous recessive for the um, R, which uh, stands for the seed shape. So this is going to result in wrinkled and yellow uh, seeds. All right, so if we take the egg from the parent on the top and we take sperm from the parent on the bottom, we're going to see what kind of offspring we might end up with. So the first step in figuring that out is to determine what are the possible gametes produced by each of these. So see if you can figure that out. So the gametes of the um, plant donating the egg are big R, big Y, big R, little y, little r, big Y, and little r, little y. So it can be all four of those combinations because the parent in this case um, was heterozygous for both traits. Now for the um, sperm donating um, individual, the male here, um, this one had only one type of um, allele for that R, for that seed shape. So in this case, there are only two possible gametes, little r, big Y, or little r, little y. So now that we know these gametes, what are the possible offspring that can result from all of these different combinations? So to figure that out, you just take the information from the egg and the information from the sperm, and you combine them together to create your diploid individual. Um, and there are eight different um, possible combinations, not all of them unique. So if you take a look, there are um, all of them um, have at least one copy of the little r, because that was the only allele from the sperm. But for all of the others, um, there's a variation. 
Let's do another example with the same kind of traits. So we are still looking at uh, seed shape and seed color. Um, in this case, we are going to start with the parental generation of one homozygous dominant and one homozygous recessive. Try to figure out the genotype and phenotype of the F1 generation. So here, because the only gamete possible um, from the um, homozygous dominant is big R, big Y, and the only gamete possible from the homozygous recessive is little r, little y, that means there's only going to be one possible genotype in the F1, which is big R, little r, big Y, little y, and that corresponds to yellow round. So the next step is to figure out the possible gametes produced by the F1 generation. Because this, uh, in the F1 generation is composed entirely of individuals that are heterozygous for both traits, um, all gametes are possible. So big R, big Y, big R, little Y, little R, little Y, and little R, big Y. And we are going to assume that all of these are equally, equally likely assuming independent assortment. More on that on the next video. But for now, we're assuming independent assortment. So what are the possible genotypes and phenotypes for the F2 generation, that next generation, assuming we take two individuals of the F1 and we um, cross them? So are all of the genotypes and phenotypes that are produced equally likely? So there are going to be two ways to answer this question. So before we get into what all those possibilities are, let's just figure out the strategies we can use. Two major strategies are Punnett square and the law of probabilities. Let's try a Punnett square first. So using a Punnett square, um, we take all of the gametes from all of the male gametes and all of the female gametes, and then we combine those to see all of the offspring. So we end up with um, four resulting phenotypes, but not all of them are equally likely. And you can see that in this diagram. The other method of determining the same information, instead of drawing it all out as a Punnett square, we can use the law of probabilities. Um, this, is, this comes from, there's more information on your formula sheet, but the idea here is that to find the probability of two things happening, we multiply the probabilities of each event occurring uh, together. So for example, the likelihood of round and yellow is the likelihood of round times the likelihood of yellow. So in this case, the likelihood of round is three-quarter, and the likelihood of yellow is three-quarter. So you multiply those together to get nine-sixteenths. Um, try this method out and see what the likelihood is of offspring that are round and green um, from this same cross, from a dihybrid cross like is seen in this, um, in this F1 times F1 um, cross. So the likelihood of offspring that are round and green is 3 sixteenths, and that comes from the likelihood of them being round of 3 quarters times the likelihood of them being green, which is 1 quarter. So 3 quarter times 1 quarter ends up with 3 sixteenths. So it's really fine to do either of these methods to determine um, predicted offspring um, phenotypes and genotypes, but you should at least be able to do a Punnett square if asked. That's it for this video. Next time we will uh, dive into some more complicated inheritance patterns of non-Mendelian genetics.